Okay. Yeah, good. Oh, I'm so glad to be with you this morning. Um, you know, it, it is true with the Sunday schedule, what it is, your pastoral staff often feels torn in so many different directions, right? And so I am thankful for an opportunity to be here in the Mosaic Room. And I also lament the fact that I'm missing our second service this morning, just like when I'm in second service at El Encuentro, um, I miss this. And so I'm really thankful for all the work uh, that Mike is doing this morning, but the tech team does overall because I watch Mosaic a lot um, the, in the coming days as these things get po posted. And I have to say, I didn't do myself any favors by scheduling myself after Christy Berghoff. Like I watched her and I was like, well, I'm not gonna be that articulate. Like that was incredible. Her, her stories and her experience of growing up here um, of coming back here after being away was so powerful. Um, and I was so blessed by her and by so many of our, our Mosaic speakers. As part, of a, um, as part of what the team does as the Mosaic team in planning this, it is, it's always so cool to see how the picture comes together and we are able to put together such a, a lovely uh, slate of speakers. Um, yeah, I'm a loud talker, so I might not need to be as mic'd as all that. I tend to project naturally. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> there was, th last week, just coincidentally, before I begin, um, it, last week, uh, Grayson and I, my 11-year-old my, my son and I, got to go to uh, the Michigan game in Ann Arbor, and at the end of yes, or last week's Sunday service, I felt my voice crack on the benediction, and I was like, oh boy, I didn't quite make it because both of our voices were hoarse from yelling so much on Saturday that when we came in, I was like, oh, I'm a little worried about how this is going to go, but I made it through, and then I heard my voice crack at the benediction. I was like, okay, no more. Um, so anyway, it is, I didn't do that yesterday, um, but uh, it, it's, it's good to, to be here. So today, we're going to talk about home. And that is sort of uh, a, a picture of why it is that Third Reformed Church is, is going through a, a sermon series on home right now. Like, what's that about? And often, I want to say that this, this question has a couple of answers. Some of them really, really perfunctory, right? Like, that some of them are just because uh, my first year here, we invested a lot of time and energy into a summer series because at the call I was at previously, summer was the time that you really launched into a deep dive into a book of the Bible or into th a thematic series. Um, and uh, it was a time that uh, we were able to kind of gather around. Well, shockingly, uh, you won't believe this, but Holland is not Ann Arbor, and Ann Arbor is not Holland, and the rhythms of this place are very different um, because uh, we like to be on vacation in the summer, which is good. Now, I, I want to affirm that. And so we had done this whole Galatian series my first summer here, and then we as a staff circled up afterwards, and we were like, what did we think? And we were like, we should never do a summer series again because nobody's here, not with any consistency at least. So we said, hey, let's, let's try something in the fall. And last fall we did sort of, uh, we called it beginnings, and it was a revisiting of the first 11, 12 chapters of Genesis, just to remind ourselves what's happening here, right? Because so much of what Jesus does in the Gospels, the way Paul writes in the New Testament in particular, is predicated on a particular um, contextual and Hebraic understanding of the creation of the universe, of all things. And Jesus speaks from that, he teaches from that, he lives into that, he helps us understand that. And so if we get creation, um, if we make creation in scriptures, what scripture says about creation, um, if we make it say something it doesn't intend to say, we can kind of get off track in a variety of different directions about what Jesus is, is talking about, and about what the New Testament and the way the New Testament longs to teach us about what our life in Jesus is supposed to look like. And so in much the same way, as your staff was circling up last spring and thinking about what it is we should be talking about, one of the themes we kept coming back to was this idea of home or place. And it wasn't because um, 
This isn't something that third knows or something that third hasn't heard before, but there's a particular urgency with us, and I think culturally right now, with us coming out of a global pandemic, which feels like both years ago and also not that long ago, about us remembering again what it means to be a gathered people. The church in its inception, and its very beginnings in Acts chapter 2 was to be a church that gathers, was to be a church that is with one another. In 2020, that became increasingly difficult, and our conceptions of what that would mean coming out of the pandemic would never be the same again. Study after study continues to show how our ability to re-enter um, the, the, uh, uh, the culture and the communities in which we were a part of before the pandemic are uh, forever altered or in some cases next to impossible. And so now we are left with a set of questions about what kind of communities are we called to create? And so for third, as, as your pastoral staff started to think about this question, we started to come back to some of, the, some of the old answers that have always been true about church and some new nuances that we wanna speak to. And so that's one of the reasons of home now and another reason of home now is because of the way that third has again come out of the pandemic and because I, three years ago uh, when i started we asked a series of questions about values and vision and we had a lot of meetings together and we're talking about those things and believe it or not your consistory at the time said hey three years from now let's have that conversation again and so there's already been some consistory meetings where we as consistory and small groups have broken up and begun to um, chat again together about the current vision and direction of Third Reformed Church. How are we doing with the vision we set three years ago? Are we still on track to accomplish the things we had hoped to accomplish? Do we need to pivot and change course in any way? The answer may shock you, it may not, but is yes to all of those things, even the things that don't agree with each other, right? Because um, whenever you sit and you answer or try to, uh, try to um, unpack big, large questions about direction and vision and mission, um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, thoughts and ideas, but also lived experience that we share. And so your consistory is already starting to unpack that. Well, out of that visioning three years ago, we had a couple of uh, two, two foci that we had. The first one is we wanted to practice the third way. Practice the third way. And third way thinking is both really common in the Christian tradition right now. It's almost fad-like, right? A lot of people are talking about the third way, and a lot of people are talking about the third way in the Reformed tradition in particular, because we are actively, denominationally, or by uh, just one degree or two degrees of separation, hearing about other Reformed traditions, having conversations about human sexuality that are in-out conversations, and there is a, a groundswell of people within those conversations that are wondering, is a third way possible? Now, third way doesn't mean that you choose neither option. Third way means that you live together in the midst of difference. It's a posture, not a position. Right, So we as Third Reformed Church have been talking a lot about how do we sit in a posture, not a position. Not just on human sexuality, although that seems to be the issue of the day, but uh, and one of the main ones that the church is dealing with, but about a lot of things. Because surprise, surprise, when you get a lot of people in one room and say, you are now one community in Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit, um, we don't agree as much as what we think we ought to about most things, right? Like, And so whether whether your uh, favorite instrument for worship is the organ in 10 a.m. or the electric guitars and drums in 11.30, we might have a difference of opinion. And, sh and <laughs> I'm here to tell you that sometimes my opinion varies on the Sunday, right? Because like there are some days that there is nothing better for my soul than to hear uh, Linda really open up that organ. And boy, are we blessed to have Linda, right? Um, it was uh, on the wedding on Friday too. She Linda just opened up the pipes and it was like, 
there wasn't any dust left in that sanctuary. I mean, it all got blown out. And it all, oh, and, and even the wedding party was coming up to me before the wedding and they were like, do you hear that? I'm like, oh yeah, we hear it, right? Like it's, it's amazing. And it just, it's so good. And it fills me with such joy. And in the same way, that mournful droning of the organ can, can help me move into a Lenten space in a way that I so deeply appreciate. And then there are other Sundays that the joy and the clapping and the rhythm of the drums will, will bring me into worship. But those things are things that we know are different about us. The way that we like to, um, and the way that we have our, our personal uh, preferences about any number of things, whether that's when we begin a service, the way in which that service looks, what venue and setting, Christians disagree all the time. And it is important for us as Christians and really important. And one of the things we wanted to focus on and what I heard really from the congregation, what y'all said to me when I first came here is, those of us that are together coming out of this pandemic just want to be together. And that signals a third way posture. We will not agree on everything. And we haven't since I've been here. I'm here to tell you. And it is really important that we embody enough grace and enough room for each other um, to live into those differences as possible so that we can celebrate the things that we do really have in common, our life and our uh, in Jesus Christ. And I want to commend third because we have done a lot to that end, right? We have uh, had intergroup dialogue. We have had uh, increased opportunity to speak openly and honestly about things that have hurt or wounded us in, in past. And we have continued to build toward in our themes of worship, a spirit of unity that has allowed for the mul multiplicity of uh, positions. And so that was one of the foci. And I know this is a really long introduction, but I just want to orient us properly so you can get a sense of what your pastoral staff is thinking. But the second one, the second focus that we talked about three years ago and, and that we presented in consistory uh, said, yes, this, this is where we're going, is be a second home. Be a second home. And the reason that that came out over and over again was for, uh, for a couple of reasons. The first was that we were noticing an incredible potential in what is now our El Encuentro service. When I started, there, that was really not a service. And that doesn't have anything to do with me. And now like, it's not like, oh, Ryan came and others. No, 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 nothing about that. But what I'm saying is when I came, there was just a few people and it was more like a Bible study. And in fact, they met in here, not in the fellowship hall. And there was just sort of like a, a reflection in a time of prayer. And it was really wonderful and really lovely. But something began to happen. And that was the uh, reputation of this church, which began long before I got here and was really strengthened through the pandemic as a congregation that was there for new uh, arrivals to this country from other parts of the world, particularly Latin America, were coming and finding rides to appointments, were coming and finding uh, were coming and finding assistance more than the assistance and more than the rides, what they were also coming to find and something that only the church can provide is supporting relationships and prayer uh, to God for the needs that they have in their life. And that was something that then began to grow El Encuentro to the point now where uh, a few weeks ago, I think it was on the first Labor Day weekend or something, there were well over 70 people in El Encuentro, which is just amazing. And it continues to grow. New people continue to come and also so not just on a Sunday morning, but are come, but come and find, uh, still find the rides, the assistance, and the loving support and the prayer that they've been looking for. So we we say thanks be to God for that. And one of the things that we talked about early on as a congregation in in my time here was how do we create home for them? What does it mean to create home for them? We're a historic church in the middle of Central City Holland. We know, uh, you know, like our pulpit Bible is still sits in the back in Dutch open to the prophet Jeremiah. What do we possibly have to say to these people coming from different countries and cultures? And it turns out that there was actually a lot, a lot of shared experience. Maybe it wasn't our experience, but it was the experience of generations before us that knew what, uh, knew what chaos um, uh, immigrating uh, and emigrating to the United States was about how 
through generations, God continued to show faithfulness to those that set roots down here in Holland about how we found that it was a good place to be, about how we found home here for ourselves, about how we found a community that was supportive and, and could grow our families. And, and we were so thankful for that. And as others came and moved in and around and among us, we said, hey, maybe that's something we want to do too. And in fact, in this church's history, um, we had an opportunity, a decision, uh, and I was just talking to a, a church member this week about how they still remember the meeting at Third Reformed Church when it was, should we stay here or should we go and buy property? And they still remember one of their loved ones standing up and, and speaking about how important it was that we stay here amidst the community changing around us, and be uh, who God has called us to be, both in building and in people. I found, I found, and the way she spoke was so inspiring to me about that. The fact that she remembered that meeting so clearly, still articulated uh, a, a love just for the placidness, right? And so what does it mean to create home? That same sense of, of uh, tenderness of place here at, you know, 12th and Pine uh, to allow other people to also find that, that tender spot, that safety, that belonging uh, that exists here. And the other, the other side of this, so that's the one side, the, the, the growth that we've seen and, and uh, new arrivals to this country. But the other part of that is also... Um, how we continue to be a people in the midst of incredible uh, division and, um, and turmoil in other places that we find our life. In fact, um, I was speaking with another parishioner and, and uh, I was like, I'm going to use this. I'm not going to tell you I'm going to use this, but I'm going to use this story. Uh, <laughs> and that was a couple of weeks ago talking with someone who, who saw a group of our students uh, doing crafts out in the lawn at Backyard Bash and said, this is what I always hoped a church could be for my kids, right? Like, and the, the longing and seeing creativity being worked out amongst uh, people that were comfortable enough to, on a hot Wednesday night, show up to church and enjoy something that spoke to their giftedness right where they are. Um, and it was the creativity that has spun its way out. And this decision to be a community and to be a people, um, to, to find your people here, is something that we're trying to create about creating a second home. Um, because we all have connections to a whole lot of different community places and people, and uh, we're connected through uh, maybe our kids' schools, or maybe we're connected through different organizations that we sit on boards for, or, or things that we do throughout the community, throughout the week, or where we live. Um, you know, Freedom Village, I see some, some Freedom Village people here, and like the community that y'all have cultivated where you are is really incredible, right? And so there's a lot of that. You are, you are, you are placed there. Right. And so what does it mean to think of Third Reformed Church as a place that is unlike other places, a place where your people are, a place of home? So we as a staff recognized those factors being at work and really wanted to dive into this idea of home. And when we talk about the idea of home, and being a second home for people, because we recognize people have their places of residence, so a second home. When we talk about, <clears throat> when we wanted to dive into this, we had a number of things that we wanted to be able ar to articulate through um, this series. But that's kind of the backstory of how we got here. Now, I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna ask, are there any questions or comments about anything I've said so far? And then we'll get into the, the second part of this. I'm going to take a drink of coffee, and I'm going to mute my mic. Jane. Just to add to what you've been saying, um, several times as an elder, the, the most fun for me has been receiving um, the kids who come through the church and want to join the church. Um, and they describe their church as being their church home as being almost a second home to them, and that's how comfortable they feel here. So I think that's a wonderful tribute to everyone, um, and it just warms my heart. Mm -hmm. Amen. Anybody else? 
We're going to call it hard stop at 1230. So if you have a question, be sure and ask it by that time. So thanks, Ryan. 1215. 1215. <laughs> I'm sorry. 1215. Yes. Thank you. Elaine, I'll take 15 more. No. Okay. I was just going to say, I, I, if you don't think I can talk till 1230, I've got a surprise for you. <laughs> Amen. 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 I get it. I get it. Yeah. We'll let, we'll let Elaine Lee, I'll keep everybody. No, I'm just kidding. Um, all right. So, yeah. So, so really this came out of uh, a desire for us to, to articulate the second part of this vision that we've been, we've been spending some time living into together. And so then we really got digging in um, to what home actually is. And one of the things that we spent a lot of time with is different studies and different resources in the field of uh, psychology in particular about what home is and how it functions. Like, what does it mean to, to make home and create home? And, and uh, it, it's important to have that. This isn't something that we preach on a lot, but this is part of our like background as we're thinking about this that I would love for you to know. And home does so many things for us, for our, for our mental health, for our emotional health. Um, a, a home uh, provides us with, you know, the, the obvious shelter, safety um, in the hierarchy of needs, right? Like shelter is, is, is pretty, uh, pretty high because it, it, it's something that we need in order to know and experience other things. If you're not safe, if you don't have uh, predictable shelter, it is really, really hard to learn. It is really, really hard um, to know what you're achieve, how to achieve, how to understand your purpose. Right? If you don't have a predictable place to rest, there are things that we all take for granted, like planning for the future, that just are harder to do. Um, because we're not thinking about the future; we're thinking about the right now. How do I find? safety. How do I find shelter? Another thing that uh, we experience when we experience home is, is love, acceptance, forgiveness, togetherness. And this is both what we experience when we experience um, home that is shared with other people. Now, we know that family structures can look all sorts of different ways, but these are the marks of what a shared family structure can do. It can produce um, better results for ed education, love, acceptance, forgiveness, togetherness. I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again in, because uh, it's really important for home. And uh, that is when I was doing my doctoral research uh, on, uh, there was, I came across this study that couldn't figure out any discernible correlation between high ACT scores, right? There was just this, this uh, different tabs and cross tabs of data that people were kind of puzzled by. Like, what, how, how do we know that people achieve high on the ACT? And one of, one of the things that finally occurred to them as a, a correlation, a positive correlation, was that families that eat dinner together have higher ACT scores. Those students have higher ACT scores, which says a bunch to me about food that I will tell you at any chance you let me tell you about food. But it also speaks, I think, to this idea of home, right? If you as a family find the time, and look, it doesn't matter when the time is, because sometimes if you've got teenagers running around, you're not eating till nine o'clock at night. And sometimes when you've got kids going to bed, you know, at 730, because you're just ending it for today, then eating at five. I don't care when you eat, but when you eat, you eat together in, you, in, in the Christian tradition, right? We thank God for the food. We ask that God bless uh, the people around the table as well as the food that will strengthen us to do the work of God and Christ that we've been called to. When we do those things, they are deeply formational and create a sense, again, of safety, security, acceptance, forgiveness, and togetherness and also allow people to achieve and have a sense of achievement or future thinking. And there are also other things that are, are, per, are particular for us about what having a home and a place of safety mean for us psychologically. It's good for us to have places to live because in those places to live, we have identified that we have been able to do something. We've achieved something in order to provide safety for others. And so parents who have a home for their kids 
feel better both about themselves and about um, the future that they've provided for their children. It's given them a sense of purpose that they can, when having home, can also um, empower their children to know that that safety is something to be sought after as an achievable goal. Now, having said all that, um, we can spend a lot of time talking about how achievable that may or may not be, right? Because whether or not you are able to own a home is somewhat up for grabs amongst our younger generations. They may never know home ownership in the way that some of us have been able to understand and know home ownership. Economics have made that in the United States a very difficult prospect for many, right? And the current housing market, and uh, this was now a, a couple of years old, but when we were talking a lot about home at Third Reform Church, um, we knew that Ottawa County was 30,000 housing units short. I'll say that again, 30,000 housing units short. Ottawa County is a desirable county to live. People are moving here. And so when people are moving here, we they, the, the, the demand for housing increases. And up until recently, it was very difficult um, to find a home if you weren't willing to pay over asking price and cold hard cash. <laughs> Financing did you no favors. So. Um, that is this whole setting of home and some of the psychology that's behind home. And so when we as your pastoral staff wanted to sit down, we wanted to communicate a couple of things about the biblical story of home in light of everything that I've just said. And one of the things we wanted to understand, we want y'all as Third Reformed Church to understand now in this particular moment um, is that we find in this place, in this local expression of Third Reformed Church, we hope that everything that we do helps people feel like this is a second home for them. But more than that, and theologically more important than that, we hope as Third Reformed Church that what we are doing and cultivating as a community here helps people know that our home is in a God in Christ. That we find home, scripture tells us, when we rest in the Lord. That is where we are at home. And our, our souls will continue to, to, to wander and be nomadic until we understand that God is home. So that is the first thing. And that is the creational thing. That's how we started this series, right? When we started uh, with the story of creation, we wanted to again affirm that our home is in relationship to the living God. That's the story that creation tells, is that more than anything else, God created out of love and abundance and longs for us to share that love back with God. God couldn't help but create because there was just an overflowing love that God had. And so God longs for creation to reflect that love. And so we want, first of all, for Third Reformed Church to know that our home is with God. And second, we want to talk then about the character of home that we create. That because we live in a more nomadic uh, culture, uh, one that is more transient, we can move around both uh, town, state, region, and globe uh, with relative ease. And so it is important that we also know that the importance of having a placidness or anchoredness um, in where we are. We were created to be rooted somewhere. And that doesn't mean that the people who travel all over the world aren't happy. We've seen enough of their pictures to know they are. Thank you very much, by the way. Um, we know that you can, you can achieve some level of, uh, of, uh, of happiness and a fulfillment, fulfilling life moving all over the world. But we do know, again, that there is, a, there is a desire for people to be placed and to know something about place. We are wired for a placidness, and that could be with people, and that can be with actual geography. Scripture is written from an agrarian context to an agrarian context, where families passed land from generation to generation to generation about how most people never left a couple square miles of real estate for their whole lives, because it was just where they were. 
And so these little couple acre plots that were dotting the, the region of Palestine, right? Like in Israel, they, these were the places that generations knew um, was home. And in that, there, is a, there was a, a desire in, in why we see so much in Scripture. And we don't have time to get into all of it. Believe me, I wanted this to be like a three-year-long series. It wasn't going to happen. But like, man, I would have loved to spend time in all of the Levitical uh, laws or in Numbers, um, two books of, of Torah that talk about land and how, and how land functions. For the, in the meantime, I will just... Uh, recommend to you Ellen Davis's book, which I neglected to write the title down. I'll get it for you later. But um, uh, Ellen Davis has this amazing book about land and about how Israel is people of the land and everything that was happening within the time of Israel and with the, within the laws was designed to keep land for God's people so that they would, um, their interaction with creation, with the actual substance and soil of the, of the earth would actually be a reflection of how God longs to make home in creation. And that is something we do not uh, like understand enough because many of us lived in, live in a post-agrarian world, right? Very few of us understand what it means that our livelihood um, depends on what we can pull out of the ground every growing season, right? How many, how many have a lived experience of farming? like a lived, yeah, yeah, yeah. So those of you that, who, who put your hands up, you know that with it, within your time growing up, like you, you knew a land and had a connection to the land that many of us don't have anymore. That there is an understanding of what it meant to cultivate the land that was dependent totally on things that were out of your control. Now we did our best to mechanize irrigation, for us to uh, use science and chemicals to, uh, to kill bugs or weeds or other things that weren't the things that we were trying to go or were eating the things that we were trying to grow. We did a great job of extending growing season through the miracles of science and lighting and all of this other stuff. But when you are in the ancient world and it doesn't rain, you will not have the crop that you have, in which case, what do you think is happening theologically? Anyway, that, that is a whole thing that I wish we had a lot of time for. All that to be said, when Scripture is, is, is uh, speaking to this agrarian context, what we're speaking to, what we're speaking to is a placidness that God and God's people believed was a sign of which foreshadowed all uh, the way all of creation would be. When, when God restored the world. In the Old Testament, they call that the day of the Lord. In the New Testament, we say when Christ returns, right? When Christ returns, we, we could say as Christian, God will make all things new. Now, that does not mean that we jettison the home, which is this place. I grew up with language in the evangelical world that was, uh, uh, which infiltrated some parts of my CRC experience, at least, um, that, you know, this is not my home, but I'm going to a home. Where's home? Home is heaven, obviously, right? Because that's where God wants me to be. Well, no, God doesn't want you to be in heaven. God wants you here. Heaven is important, but as N.T. Wright says, heaven's important, but it's not the end of the world, Right? Um, the end of the world is actually here in a restored earthly creation. I will never forget a story with uh, a friend's uh, son who was really worried about this idea of heaven that he was learning about in Sunday school. And so they, they said, well, can you, can you talk to our son? I said, absolutely. Uh, so we were chatting and, and he said, well, I, I hear these things about heaven and I do want to be with Jesus, but I don't hear anything about trees and I love trees, and I don't hear anything about birds, and I, I love birds, right? Um, there's this fabulous park north of Ann Arbor called Kensington Metro Park that if you just walk the trails with seed in your hand, all the birds will, will just find you, and if you stand still, they'll eat right out of your hand. You just walk the trails, and a bunch of birds eat out of your hand. It's amazing. Um, and that's one of his favorite things to do, and he's like, I, I, don't, wanna, I don't ever want to not do that. And I was like, have I got good news for you, right? The Reformed reading of Scripture is that this is our home. And when Christ returns, Christ will make 
all things new by the power of the Spirit. And so the land that we interact with should be a foreshadowing of, of that kind of new creation in Jesus Christ. That's why when we deal with climate and environment, all of that stuff is so important because it was important in the Old Testament to an agrarian society, and it's important to us now. And so all that to say, lost my place. <clears throat> Shocker, I went on a tangent. Um, <clears throat> so all that to say, when, when your pastoral staff wanted to chat about home, we wanted to talk about um, the scope of creation as our home and how um, God is our home and our relationship with uh, God and our relationship with where we are is supposed to reflect to those who long and are curious about life with God should reflect uh, who God is and who we are with God. So anyway, so God as home and the places where we, where we live are home. I'm going to pause here because I only got about five more minutes, but I want to see if there's, before we get to questions, but I want to see if there's any other questions. Again, I'm going to mute. And thanks, Peg, for running the microphone. Appreciate that. Thank you, Ryan. Your comments about the third way uh, and about big emphasis of our third way home is sharing our home. And uh, Ilan Quentro obviously is a big way that we're sharing our facility, but also our other resources, our people with them. But I wonder how many other old timers in this room remember that Ellen Quentro, and I, this was new to me, I just, you dawned on me, Ellen Quintero is not the first Spanish-speaking service series to be held at Third Reformed Church. Remember 35 years ago when we built this beautiful addition to this church? St. Francis Catholic Church down the street had a disastrous fire. And I think this is the true story. Steve Stam, our senior pastor, walked down to that church. Before the fire was out in Spanish, he said to them, my home is your home. Some of you can say it better than I did. And for the next couple of years, the English speakers went to Dimnit Chapel, but the Spanish-speaking worship service was held in our sanctuary following our service, probably at 1130. And what a wonderful relationship we had with St. Francis. Many of us remember many of those people, and many of us sort of hung around to listen to their guitars and drums and so forth. But anyway, and, and this relationship still exists to some degree at this time, but again, an example of third, sharing our home. Amen. What a great reminder and a fabulous story. I never get tired of hearing that one. Well, Thanks. I might just take a moment to just welcome the people whose faces are not as familiar to us on a weekly basis. And so we're glad to have it possible for us to have you here this morning. Thanks, Peg. Uh, Tony had one up here in the, the front row. I'm sorry it takes so long to get <laughs> Um, so my question was what you were saying about um, heaven and then your own home mm -hmm. and the place that you call your home as still being a place that is okay to be with God. Mm -hmm. Like, I suppose I just have more of a question about that. Like, could you just ex explain that a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, <clears throat> this isn't new, nor is it localized in in. in uh, Christian tradition alone. So allow me just a really, really brief tangent. Um, if you were um, in the ancient world, there were the gods and the places that you would go to worship, right? Different temples, depending on what you needed for various things. In the Greco-Roman world, this took the shape of all of the different uh, locales in which gods could be found, in which gods could be Placed and one of the real uh, for the for the Romans in particular, this was both a nationalistic identity and something that they would try and a colonizing identity. So much so that Rome uh, in the uh, did not see a whole lot of issue with putting a Roman eagle on the temple in Jerusalem when they were controlling Israel because. Well, it's ours, right? Like, this is what we do. And meanwhile, right, this is one of the things that caused a huge revolt in Israel and in Jerusalem and led to all-out war. And then 
putting out uh, the Jewish rebellion, right? But uh, at the same time as there were places to go and temples to go, um, there were also household gods that you would have. You would have your own little shrines and own little gods, and those were oftentimes the most important things, that the gods that were there in your home controlled the affairs of your home, and so you wanted to give them homage. Now, the way that a home was set up in the ancient world um, placed the kitchen in the middle, Right, because if you were in a desert climate like Israel or other parts of, of Asia Minor, right, like it could get cool in the evenings, and what you would do is you'd place the hearth in the middle, and that would allow the heat to radiate everything else. So the gods um, who were known as the household gods were the hearth gods, right? So the hearth gods are the ones that have the most important. Um, <clears throat> Uh, status. Well, the same word for hearth in in Latin, right, uh, is a is uh, is the word where or the the Latin word is focus, where we get our focus, right? Where do you put your focus? You put it in the the hearth in the household gods, and so Paul then takes this idea in the New Testament and says you need to shift your focus, right, in understanding that where you place your time isn't the gods that are the meaningless little trinkets that you put around your home, but in what uh, what you are being called toward in Jesus Christ, which is new creation. And so in the Christian tradition, when we talk about the relationship of our home or our gathered worshiping places, what we are doing is expressing new creation in Jesus Christ into the world and proclaiming that that is a reality, not because of our actions or the household trinkets that we have everywhere else, but only because of the grace received through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, which animates and compels the church, not just in one place, but as uh, scripture reminds us, any place two or three or people are gathered in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There the Holy Spirit is. Their new creation has the potential to break in by the power of the Holy Spirit. So our homes that we go to, that we live in, that we pray in, that we do our devotions in, the expectations for Christians, and I just preached on this on Friday for a wedding too, because it's the same thing, um, are supposed to reflect, our homes are supposed to reflect that relationship that God has with creation, put right. Now, we know that we always fail, right? So everybody, don't, don't feel like, oh, no. Um, no, no, no. Like we, we, failure is baked in this side of Jesus coming back. Um, but but we, we do work for, and the, and the understanding is that that is the goal to which we strive. In the same way, when we talk about Christian marriage, it is supposed to be a reflection of love that God has for creation, is the love that the, the two people who are married have that affection for one another. That should be a signpost. And that's why it's a sacrament in the Catholic Church, by the way, not in Protestant, but that's why it's a sacrament, because it's supposed to be a signpost that shows the love of God. So, oh my goodness. Yeah, are you okay? <laughs> so that is that is the relationship between home in the Christian tradition and uh, the love of God in Christ, How that a bit about how that works. And that's I, I would say that's a pretty reformed way uh, to look at it. Not every tradition will speak about it the same way, but that's my understanding of how the Reformed Church speaks about it. There are other comments, questions. Yeah. Because it probably fit there better. But I just wanted to say to the people in this room that you have made a home for our Gabriel. Mm -hmm. He considers you his family. He truly does. And I assumed until a short time ago that uh, the love that you demonstrated to him was a reaction to your knowing what his background was. And uh, I just guess I sort of assumed that, you know, gossip would get all the uh, details. And I found out that you don't know um, the, hard, the hardships that he's faced. But you loved him anyway, and you opened your hearts, and you learned his name, and you comment to him, and it means everything to him and to us. This is his second home. Thank you. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, Jane. Oh. 
and maybe you don't <clears throat> realize this, but there are many of us that sit in in the congregation and watch Gabriel interact with you. Um, he and, keeps me on my toes. <laughs> I will say that. But <laughs> it's it's always now. What will be Gabriel's message for today? Yeah. yeah. Oh. I, every time I see him come forward, I am filled with both joy and well. <laughs> <laughs> And I love it. And I love it. And, and you know what? I, I, I have to say um, that that does speak to third. I'm so glad that, that you spoke to that because there is, um, you know, when you feel as a, as a pastor as well, like not just the permission, but the shared joy in that for people to be who they are. Oh, that's a deep breath, right? Because there's not... I don't, I don't feel an expectation from this place that we get on with it or that we sh shut it down or that people are doing embarrassing things and we ought to stop and there's a proper way to behave in church. And like, you know, like there is just a permission and a wholehearted embrace of where people are. And I have to tell you that doesn't exist everywhere. And so I don't want to pat us on the back too much because there's work to be done. But and we don't like to do that as reformed folks, anyways. Not too much patting on the back, but a little bit. But a little bit. Um, that is that is a joy, and and that's a gift, and that's a gift that I feel um, in in leadership. And I would say your pastors all feel that, like the joy of being able to express a, a wholeness and a wideness um, to God to God's love in the in the context of the service, um, and even. Uh, this morning, right? The kids are sitting up there and they're being so patient and so good about the baptism. And Gabriel's got comments for me and, and things as it's happening. And some people don't want to sit where they're sitting. They'd rather sit like right next to the baptismal font and things like that. There's just a, there is a real beauty in that. And um, that is one of the ways where you're like, well, I hope, I hope that's why it, it feels like home because when it's Christmas morning, somebody wants to sit right next to the tree. And when it's baptism morning, they want to sit right next to the font. And I say, God bless them, right? Like, let's do that. Uh, anyway, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Others, other things we want to say about this. <clears throat> okay, well then, a final thing that I just wanted to mention about about this, and I do so, uh, again, trusting the same spirit of generosity and curiosity, which I feel uh, present at, at Third Reformed Church. Another reason why we wanted to speak about home is because your pastoral staff is well aware of the cultural moment we live in politically, right? And it is, it is true, right, that as we, what felt like oh, good, we've got all the way till November suddenly feels like it's almost November, right? And we are collectively um, feeling, regardless of how we feel about the election or the politics or those persons involved, any time an election happens feels like a tender time, both in families, communities, churches, and nations. And so it is true that when we talk about home and when we talk about what it means to be home, one of the things that your pastoral staff wants to communicate about the current moment right now is that, that we are shown constantly a variety of ways in which not to have the conversation, right? Every day we are inundated with ways which we shouldn't talk to, about one another, what we shouldn't talk with one another, or if we were to take um, just the ways the two parties interact more across and to and at one another, right? Like very little talking with, more talking across than at and around. And homes don't function well when that's how things go. And the turmoil that we feel in our nation is because we're not creating home. It's not working when we have this kind of dialogue. It doesn't feel sustainable. And so how does the church show up in a moment like this? The church shows up in a moment like this by talking about belonging, by talking about the lordship and the kingship of Jesus Christ, the sovereignty of God in Christ, about the church's role in, um, regardless of how you identify the best economic policy for the moment of right now, that where we really want it, what we really want to talk about is how God is making the world new in Jesus Christ, and we are called to be a part of that in spite of and in the midst of incredible difference. And if we can't do that as the church, then the church has lost its witness on the national stage in this way. 
And I fear in so many, in so many circles and in so many uh, tenors of conversation in which the church has chosen to show up over the last few election cycles that we already are losing our voice. And I don't want it to be so for the group of people which I think God has called the Third Reformed Church. And so we choose home because we want to ask the question, is it possible for us to live in the midst of incredible difference in trying times and declare that overall the reign of God is true in Jesus Christ and that is where we are putting our energy. That's where I hope we are, right? So that's another thing that is really at stake and your pastors feel is at stake. We're not gonna preach about it or talk about it every week, nor do you probably want us to, but that's one of the things what we, we wanna say is at the background. And again, we don't wanna assume any, any one thing or one way, or, or, but what we want to do is to say, are we continuing to focus on how God is making the world new in Jesus Christ? And can we demonstrate what it means to be a small community, and I don't care how small of circles this actually happens in our church, where we're still willing to be together in the midst of that kind of difference. That's what we want to figure out. And I think that it's not just true denominationally, um, but uh, I would also say as an aside, <clears throat> right, this is what the denomination of the Reformed Church in America is doing right now too. We've had a lot of churches leave over the last few years. And so however many churches we have, we want to commit to the things that make the Reformed Church the Reformed Church. And part of that is, shockingly, that we agree to be a both-and kind of denomination. You, when I go to classes and when I go to synod, there are a lot of people that think about things very differently than me. <clears throat> but I'm called to live into relationship with them and, and, and pray for the best for them because they are uh, my siblings in Christ. And that's what we're working for. Even, And I don't care if there's only five churches left in the Reformed Church in America. I love that we keep doing the things that God has called us to do. Um, there won't be just five churches left, just by the way. That, that, that's not going to happen. But, but, I want, but I wanted to just say that, right? It doesn't matter how small we are because there is so much work, global focus on mission, things like that, that are being done in the name of Jesus all over the world that excite me about where our denomination is. And, and I think that's something that could be said too. Anyway, so... Whew. There we are. That's why home right now. That's why your pastors want to talk about home with y'all this fall. Um, so again, I see that, that we've got about six or seven minutes. So Peg, are there any other questions for us? Not being afraid to talk about controversy and reminding us what are the important things. And I would ask the Vander Arks if they're willing to share a little bit more of the detail so it doesn't have to depend on gossip. Are you willing? I don't know if this is the forum for that. I, I wondered. I, I, That's I, I, yeah, yeah. Like I don't, I don't think that we should, we should put them on the spot. All right. Well, Let's I, not I wanted to give them an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. So, are there any other questions? If not, next Sunday we will convene here and hear from Jim Padillo, divorced, and he will take us in another direction for home. So we are dismissed. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>